Hi, welcome to our YouTube channel. We hope today's message is encouraging, helps you in your walk with Jesus, and that it really just speaks to you. If you'd like to help us move the mission forward, you can give um, through the link below, and we hope that you enjoy. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, long before some of you all were even born, back in 1996, um, only I find that type of stuff funny, y'all. I, I, okay, I am cutting out the age jokes, never going to point to that ever again. Um, uh, 1996 is a long, long time. When you get to be 35 years old, which is what I am, is a long, long time ago, okay? And yes, the thing that reminds me of how old I am is I meet some of you and find out how young you are. And I'm like, this is so amazing. Thank you for reminding me of my age. But anyways, I won't joke about it anymore because you don't laugh. And that's the whole point of a joke, is it not? Great. So back in 1996, a venture capitalist and kind of tech guru named Mark Ostrovsky, he um, shocked his peers when he chose to spend $150,000 on the domain name business.com. In fact, Forbes um, wrote about this, and, and they said this. is that at the time, industry insiders couldn't believe anyone would pay such an absurd amount of money for a simple dictionary word between the www and the dot com. Three years later, um, however, in 1999, uh, he did all right in his return when he flipped that uh, business dot com domain name over to e companies um, for seven million dollars. And that is actually pales comparison to the most expensive sale of a domain name, which happened in 2014, um, when cars.com, the entire company of cars.com, was sold, and the entire company was sold for $1.8 billion, and the domain name cars.com alone was valued at $872 million. Now, if you're a geek like me, you could spend some time um, later today and you could dig through, you know, what makes a domain name um, valuable. And if you did, you'd find that there's a lot of different variables from, uh, you know, how easy it is to spell, very logistical stuff like that, how, how, how short it is, um, whether or not it is a, a top-level domain like .com or .biz, um, how long um, the domain name has been around and how much traffic it has generated. Um, in its history, but one of the most um, uh, important and indicative variables of a domain name's value, um, it can be traced back to the popularity of the keyword that the name possesses. Or rather, how many people are actively going into Google and searching for what the domain name is. For instance, um, even before cars.com became a very successful, very popular automotive classified website, the domain name itself, cars.com, already had a whole lot of value. Why? Because there's a whole lot of people in this world that are going to Google and searching cars. And I can tell you that the, the opposite is also true from personal testimony, that there are some domain names that have absolutely no value because no one's going on the internet looking for it. For instance, jakeworth.com, not a whole lot of value. I know because I bought it seven years ago for $9.99, baby. Not a whole lot of people running that, that, that Google search. All that to say um, that in a name, just a name, can have an insane amount of value depending upon how many people are searching for what the name is. Now, um, to our knowledge, Jesus did not take any SEO classes. Uh, scholars unanimously say that actually SEO did not exist back in Bible times. And I can also tell you that Jesus did not work at RevLocal, which was the internet marketing company that I worked for in Columbus, Ohio, back in 2014. And yet, in Matthew 6... When Jesus launched into his prescribed pattern for prayer called the Lord's Prayer, and he gave us the name by which we should address God, out of all the names for God that Jesus could have given uh, us to access God's presence, out of all of the names Jesus could have told us to type into our spiritual search browsers, Jesus picked the most Valuable name for God due to how many people are desperately searching for it. When he said this in Matthew 6, 9, when you pray, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be 
thy name. The title of my message today is Keyword Father. Keyword Father. If this is your first time, we, we started this series a, a couple, uh, last week, and I'd highly recommend that you go back and listen to that message as it sets up um, kind of the tone and the idea behind it all, but to get you up to speed, the big idea behind this series is to use a historical concept, that of a trading post from the Western Settlement era, um, to use a historical concept um, for an, as an illustration for a spiritual reality, and that spiritual reality is prayer. As we talked about last week, prayer is where we go to get God. Prayer is, as the video said, where um, we take all that we are, all that we're wrestling with, and we exchange it for who God is. We don't go to prayer merely to get something from God. We don't go to prayer in order to um, see what God can do for us, but by way of prayer, we access God himself Prayer is the spiritual trading post where we go to get God. And if you were here last week, um, at the end of the message, um, you received one of these prayer guides that we handed out. Um, and I encourage you, if you didn't get one last week, um, they are all over in the next steps area on the, the high boy tables and the, the next steps table. Grab one of these um, because we are walking through um, the Lord's Prayer on a daily basis um, for the remainder of this series over the next uh, 30 or, or so days now. And what this prayer guide is designed to do is two things. Number one, to prompt you to pray. But not maybe like how you usually pray, which is, oh, I need to pray, dear God, hey, so, and then you just lose your train of thoughts, depending upon what's been going through your mind all day. But this is to prompt you to get away, to get off the beaten path, to give yourself a break, go on, you deserve it to turn off the phone and for 15, 20 minutes to be alone with you and God, to establish a trading post. And then the second thing this guy does is it walks through the Lord's Prayer. And as we are going through this series, we're, we're taking notice to five different exchanges that happen throughout the Lord's Prayer. Five distinct exchanges. Again, the point of prayer is not to exchange information, Jesus said it, we talked about this last week, God already knows what you need. He already knows what you're going through. The point of prayer is to offer up what you need, offer up what's going on, offer up who you are, and exchange what we usually tightly hold onto and release it, release our lives over to God for God. If you're following along, on the, the very first um, part of the Lord's Prayer, we have our scripture for today, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then I just want to read you a, an excerpt that will give us some direction for today. Um, it says, who you are defines who I am. The fact that I get to call you Father tells me everything I need to know about myself. As we dive into this idea about Father, I want to, I want to give you three things that the name Father says about us. Three things the name Father says about us. As always, the very best way to read scripture is to first look at how the initial audience would have interpreted what was said. And for the predominantly Jewish audience that Jesus was speaking to here in the Sermon on the Mount, um, to hear Jesus commanding them to call God Father as they approach um, him in prayer, um, in one sense it would have been par for the course um, with how they had learned about God throughout their entire lives. The, the Jewish Bible, or what we call the Old Testament, it is full of scripture regarding God as father in the sense that he is maker or designer of all that exists. Here's a few scriptures to give you an idea of how the Jewish people would have come to know about God. Nehemiah 9, 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made. Somebody say made. Oh, let's try that again. Somebody say made. Don't make me go full charismatic on y'all today. Y'all are sleepy. I can tell that. All right, maybe you just got lulled into the presence, sweet presence of Jesus. All right, snap out of it. All right, wake up. All right. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all of their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life. Somebody say life. 
You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you, Psalm 92. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, or you are Elohim. You alone are creator, Psalm 139, 13 through 14. For you formed my inward parts, and you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully, one last time, say the word, made but of course the most foundational scripture that um, the jews would have drawn back to for looking at god as designer and maker would have been all the way back at the beginning in genesis 1 and 27 which says so god created human beings in his own image in the image of god he created them male and female he created them. Here's the first thing the name Father says about us. It tells us where we come from. It tells us where we come from. It gives us our origin. It gives us our origin. Unlike how we might, you know, talk about Hippocrates being the, the father of modern um, medicine. Yes, I did not know that before this last week. I Googled it, okay, and now I'm flexing it on you, all right? Sorry, I don't want you to give you the, the false impression that I'm, uh, he is studied, reads Hippocrates. You go on and believe that. What I would probably say is, like, while I might suggest that Giannis Antetokounmpo is the, the uh, father of the three-dribble full-court dunk, if you've ever watched him scale the entire basketball floor, he is the father of that. While, while that, we might talk about father in, in that way, when the Jews talked about God as being the father of humanity, they were not ex uh, expressing that we existed outside of God, and then God acquired us, and then he influenced us like we we were raw materials waiting to be worked with. But instead, when they thought of God as father of humanity, they were expressing one of the most breathtaking details of the Jewish theology and now the Christian theology, and it is this, that we come from God. God is our father. He is who we can trace our being back to. Why is that important? Because... One of the most, um, the oldest and most popular struggles of humanity is with personal identity. And knowing who we really, really are. Lots of us spend our whole lives trying to figure out who we really are. And I don't think it's, um, you know, uh, inappropriate to say that uh, we are, as a society, in an identity crisis. And we have been for quite some time. We're in good company from, from, you know, identifying ourselves through our financial success or through our sexuality. We're trying to figure out who we are. And this dates all the way back. Jesus himself was assaulted by an identity crisis. Did you know that? Did you know that right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he went out into the wilderness, the devil began to tempt him and, and attempted to get Jesus to deviate from who he was and, and deviate from his, his God status? Do you know how the devil started two of those three attempts? He said this, if you are the son of God, then turn these stones into bread. Second one, if you are the son of God, throw yourself off the building and the angels will rescue you as your word says. In other words, if you are who you say you are, who you think you are, then you're going to need to prove it. You're gonna need to demonstrate it. You're gonna need to do something that substantiates it. And yet, as you probably already know, Jesus did not flinch because, I don't know if the devil didn't get this memo, but little did the devil know that those temptations were actually on the back end right after Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3. And do you know what God the Father spoke over Jesus the Son after Jesus was baptized? Just like some of y'all are going to get baptized next week, and some of you should get baptized next week. Here's what God the Father spoke over Jesus. Before Jesus had done any miracles, before Jesus had turned the water into wine, before Jesus had gone and raised Lazarus and everyone was going, I think this is the Son of God. Before Jesus had done anything that substantiated him as the Son of God, here's what the God the Father said over Jesus, Matthew 3, 17. This is my Son, whom I love, and with him... I am well pleased. 
get this mix, when you know who formed you, you don't have to figure yourself out. It is one of the great freedoms that we find in Christ. That you don't have to figure it out. You don't have to make a name for yourself. You don't have to prove anything when you know who you come from and when you know what that person has spoken over you. You don't have to spend your life searching for identity. You don't have to come back to Google typing in identity, identity, identity through your behaviors, through your actions, through your words. When you know who your father is, you don't have to figure out who you are. Because who you are comes from who he is. How you feel about yourself is not who you are. Can it be confusing? Oh my gosh, yes. Oh, it's freaking, it is so freaking confusing. When all of those feelings are so marked up by sin, again, sin being that orientation to make us deviate. Oh man, it can confuse us, but we are not our feelings. I want to let you also know, and I don't know who this is for, but you are also not what you do. What you do does not define you. It can smear you up a bit, for sure. It can jack you up again. It can cloud your, your identity. The consequences of what you do can make you think that you are something else. But hear me right now. God still has the blueprints. God still has the original drawings. He hasn't lost sight of how he made you. And the sooner that we run to our Father and we release who we think we are and we release who we're trying to be and we release what we're attempting to prove about ourselves, the sooner we can find out who we really are by looking into the Father's eyes. In one sense that the Jews, um, they would have been tracking with Jesus by if, he, if all he meant by Father was their designer. They, they didn't have a beef with that, nor would they have raised eyebrows with the second thing that the name of Jesus says about us. Because it actually flows right from the first. And it's that the name Father tells us, tells us how to live. Tells us how to function. Tells us how to be. Father shows us who our authority is. Second thing that the name Father says about us is it says who our authority is. Back to humanity's origin story in the book of, of Genesis. In Genesis 1 and 2, God created man and woman. He, he was the father of humanity. And then right after making them, right after forming them, do you know what he did? What his first conversation with them was about? About what to do. Right after designing them, here's some directions. Go. Rule, have dominion over the earth, or maybe a better translation for us, because that we, we, we don't necessarily know how to interpret that word, is, is flourish, unlock its potential, expand, do good. Because he alone sits in the seat of designer, he gave them direction based on his design. In other words, God commanded them to go and flourish and do good because that's what he designed them to do. Follow the progression. I hope this helps. God, who is good, he is good. He is the definition of good. He is all that is good. God, who is good, made us. And what did he say about us when he made us? Good. He actually said, you're very good, because unlike all of the other creation, we were made in the image of God. God, who is good, made us, who he said is good, to do what? To do good. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it in Ephesians 2.10. He said, for we are God's workmanship. We are the works of his hand. We are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, going to get to that in a little bit, to do what? To do good works, which he planned for us far in advance. Think of it this way. God isn't in a place of authority because he was unjustly promoted. <laughs> like it's not because like someone lost his job and we just had to find someone and God just seems like the best kid. It's also not because he inherited and like his dad died and so God, well, he just gave the whole company to him. God, God is in a place of authority over our lives because he is our origin and therefore he is the leading expert on how to live problem with this point, however, 
is that you and I still have a whole lot of our earthly parents. And I don't mean Bob and Deb, if that's what your parents' names are. I mean our earthly parents, Adam and Eve, who began the cycle of sin in our world when they, oh, what did they do? They resisted God's authority and they did the one thing he told them not to do. And because they sinned, we struggle with sin. And I know you already know this because it's something we all experience to some degree, but one of the side effects of struggling with sin is an allergy to God's authority. I wish I could have tested all of y'all's blood pressure when I said, and my second point is authority. No claps. I mean, we haven't been doing much clapping today regardless, but definitely weren't any claps on, oh my gosh, thank you, Jesus, thank you. This is gonna be good. I'm looking forward to what he has to say about this. Why? Because we associate authority with oppression. We, we tend to associate authority with a lack of liberty. We immediately think that if, be, if someone has authority over us, it means that they are limiting us. And part of that is because that's how we've seen authority fleshed out in our own lives, where you have seen someone use their authority in really bad ways. And they flex their authority in your life, not to help you do good or experience good, but it was actually bad that they were in a place of authority. Some of it is due to that, but some of it just is traced all the way back to the initial outbreak with Adam and Eve. Can I show you? Can I show you? Great, Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Here's uh, when the woman was engaging with the, the serpent. He, the serpent, said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Here he's just trying to get a conversation going, get, it, get her to start thinking about uh, the legitimacy of what God said. And the woman said to the serpent, you may eat from, uh, uh, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree, from the, tree uh, from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. That's really great. God said that. And you must not touch it. Nah, God actually didn't say that, but okay. Or you will die. Yep, God did say that. Verse four, you will certainly not die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Notice what happens after, after that little statement. Verse six, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good, she looked at it and what did she think? Oh, that looks good. And it was pleasing to the eye. And it was desirable for gaining wisdom. I want my eyes to be open. She took some and she ate it. Notice this mix. Eve wasn't tempted by the fruit until Satan got her to believe a lie about God. Eve did not get sidetracked and start to drool over the fruit until she second guessed the goodness of God's authority. You will certainly not die. God knows that if you eat the fruit, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil, a.k.a. God's holding out on you, a.k.a. God is holding you back, a.k.a. God is not a good father who wants good for his kids, but it was a lie, and it is the same lie that you and I face almost on a daily basis where we look around and we've got this lie going through our brain that is God really good? Does he, does he really want what's good? And then what do we see? Oh, that looks good. I think that's good. But God said I wasn't supposed to, but I'm not really. But it was, it was the complete opposite of what God said he wanted for him. It was a lie. It was the complete opposite from how God flexed his authority. Here's what God's exact words were to Adam back in chapter 2. This was how the big bad authority figure, okay? You want to see how bad of an authority figure, how just manipulative God was? This is what God said to Adam back in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. You are free. Someone say free. Free. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you'll certainly die. You are free to eat from any but that one. Because if you eat from it, you will certainly die. In other words, you are free to do and experience 
everything except for the one thing that will end up killing you. You are free to eat from any tree except for the one that's going to give you knowledge of good and evil. What does that mean, knowledge of good and evil? Up until the point that Eve ate the fruit, all they knew was good. They had no context for evil. And God says, I don't want you to know evil. I just want you to know good. I just want you to be fully wrapped up and just consumed by what you were designed for and who you are. Don't eat the knowledge of good and evil because if you do, you will know evil. And what you will come to find out is that evil will kill you. Evil will destroy your life. Evil will run you down. Evil will break your body. It will kill you. So don't eat that. Don't miss this, mixed church. God's authority is oppressive if your aim is autonomy. God's authority is, is oppressive if your aim is to do whatever you want. If that's the goal of your life, is to do whatever you want. If the goal of your life, if the aim of your life is to operate in your own understanding, then you are absolutely 100% correct. If your aim is autonomy, God's authority is wildly oppressive. But get this, it is freedom if your aim is to live. If you want to live, it's actually freedom. I say this every single message, it seems like. What did Jesus come proclaiming? I have come to bring life and life abundant. I don't want you to be stuck in death where your entire life is dying. I want you to experience life and life abundant. And then do you know what Jesus spent a whole lot of his teachings talking about? What to do and what not to do. We just came out of that little mini-series called Soul Surgery where we learned, oh, Jesus was pretty passionate about not living in our anger. He was pretty passionate about not experiencing orgasticide, that, that burning anger, that resentment that just broods in your soul. Oh, Jesus was actually really, really passionate about manipulating the truth where we like the truth when it's good for us but we object to the truth if it assaults who we are or where we were currently thinking of going. No, don't manipulate the truth. Jesus would go on to say, don't let money be your God. Be generous. Give. You can't serve two masters. If you're not generous with your money, if you're not giving what you have been given, it is your God. Oh, Jesus was so passionate about what we do. And is it because he's just power hungry? Is it just because, oh, man, he just, he just loves restricting us. And, and this is his favorite pastime is just locking us down and living us. No, it's because he wants us to live. I know this might be the first time for some of you, but you bought into a lie when you listened to someone 10 years ago who was talking about the rules of God and what Jesus said and, uh, for us to do and not to do, and, and, they, and they were emphasizing just a life of limitations. Those same limitations are to unleash you so that you can continue to live. It's because he loves you that he limits you. It's because I freaking love EJ so much that when he starts running towards 68th Street, I grab his wrist so fast and I say, no. We stay on the sidewalk. So, yeah, that's exactly what I say. And then he grows up and he is getting counseling. My dad kept on saying, sidewalk, and I can't figure out what he was talking about. Man, talk about ruining a really serious moment. but it's because I love my son, and that's why I limit him. And over time, those limitations change in some ways, but some remain the exact same. That as he, as, as he matures, all of a sudden you start expanding, you've got wisdom. Could it be that God is limiting you from stuff right now? Because it's not because it's good, it's not because it's bad, it's just you're not ready for it. And he's flexing his authority, he's like, no, you're not yet ready to cross the street on your own. The Jews, they, they, were, they, were, cool with, they were cool with God, looking as God as, as, as a designer, if that's all that Jesus meant. They, they were, they were uh, cool with thinking of God as their authority. I mean, that's what, that's what they knew was a whole lot of God saying, here's exactly what I want you to do, how to do it, and if you don't do it, you're gonna die. And it's gonna wreak... Havoc, but what they were not accustomed to 
was the third and final thing the name Father says about us. Let's get this. When Jesus began the Lord's Prayer and he told his followers, predominantly Jewish, to pray our Father, he didn't use just any name for Father. But he specifically used a word for Father that he would use over and over and over again throughout his ministry. And it was this Aramaic word for Father that's pronounced Abba. Abba. And the thing that's unique about this word for Father is that it doesn't just communicate, um, when he was using it, it, it didn't just communicate to his audience where they could trace their lineage back to. It didn't just, it doesn't just communicate who founded them. It also doesn't just express who was, who's calling the shots, who alone is supreme and knows what is good and what is evil. Doesn't, it didn't just express an authority figure, but instead this word Abba, it's bigger than bloodline and it's even more significant than influence. It was the word for father that a little Hebrew boy or a little Hebrew girl would use as they ran into their father's arm after scraping their knee or, or wanted to show their dad something that excited them. And that's exactly the best translation that we have for Abba is that it means dad. Or way to really point that Jesus was daddy. Not just dad, like you've grown up and you're too big and too old to call your father daddy, which happens to all of us. But daddy. What does this word that Jesus wanted us to use when we interact with God on a daily basis, what does the word say about us? It says where we come from. It shows us our true identity and origin. It frees us from the burden of having to find ourselves and also tells us how to live. It shows us who should sit as, as the supreme authority over, over our lives. It says who we need to look to if our aim is to live. But thirdly, it also tells us that we have access to an intimate and loving relationship with God. Doesn't just say this word, Abba. It doesn't just say that he's our creator, even though he is. It doesn't just say that he's our authority, even though he is. It says he's our dad. It tells us that we are not products that came from a celestial assembly line. But rather we need to look at ourselves as children, as sons, as daughters. And the Jews there in the audience, their, their jaws would have dropped. Not because they couldn't fathom looking at God as like their paternal father or because they couldn't see God as their authority, but because for the last hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, they had gone back and forth between obeying God and then resisting God, following God's ways and then rebelling against his commands, loving God deeply and then hating and resenting him. And so the last thing they would have expected Jesus to say when he told them, when you go to be with God, when you pray, would be for us to call him dad but that's exactly what Jesus said and here's why because that is who Jesus came to give us access to there's no better illustration of this one than the most famous parable that Jesus ever shared you know it um, as the prodigal son or the parable of the sons two sons and I know you probably heard this um, story a, a few times, if not a thousand times, but um, I'd really love to read the entire story pretty quickly. It's 21 verses long. And I'd love for us to read this story in light of what we're learning about this idea of Father and who He is. And I'll point out maybe some, some things that we should bring our attention to, but, but in light of, of God the Father being our origin, authority being our dad let's read this real quick Jesus told a story once and he said there was a man who had two sons 
the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of estate. This was to say, you're dead to me. I don't need you. I don't want you. And so the father def- divided the property between the sons. And not long after that, the younger son, he got together all that he had and he set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. And so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to to feed with the pigs. It was really, really bad to be working with pigs. It was also really, really bad as a Jewish person to hire yourself out, contract yourself out to a Gentile, a citizen of that country. This guy is, is reaching the low of all lows right now. And in verse 16, it says, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Notice that he's starving and the pods start looking good. He's so low that he starts looking at the very food he's feeding the pigs and he starts thinking what Eve thought. That looks kind of good. And so he he came to his senses And he said to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And and here I am starving to death. Here's what I'll do. I'll go and I'll set out and I'll go back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm not here to be your son. Um, But make me like one of your hired servants. I'll work for you. And so he got up and he's got this plan and he goes back to the father. But one of the most beautiful scriptures in all of the Bible, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And filled with compassion for his son, he ran to his son. And he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you. Here's what I've, you know, kind of scripted together as my apology. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he continues to speak. Notice the verse stops there. Why did it stop? Because his father interjected. In verse 18, there was more that the son wanted to say. He had a proposition to give his father. But once he met his father, once he got back to him, he wasn't able to express the proposition he had thought of. Why? Because the father interjected him and he said, turns to the the servants, he said, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. These were all uh, uh, very symbolic for heir, for for being... um, Uh, uh, a part of the family of a signifying you're my blood and he said bring the fatted calf and kill it let's have a a feast and celebrate for this son of mine he was dead and he's now alive he was lost and is found notice what what God what father did not say he didn't say for this son of mine was not my son he came back and now he's my son but he said no 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 he's always my son but it was that he was dead but now he's alive he was always my son, but he was lost. And now he's, he's found, and so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the second son, the older son, was in the field, and when he came near the house, he saw the music, and he heard the dancing, and he called one of the servants, and he asked him, what, what's going on here? And the servant said, your brother has come home, and, and, he, and your father has killed the fat calf. We were saving that, um, but he seems like this is a w- worthy celebration. I guess because his son came back to him safe and sound in verse 28, the older brother became very angry and he refused to go in. He refused to go in and celebrate the, the, uh, um, the, uh, retrieval, the coming back, the, the, um, redemption of his, his brother. And so his father went out and he pleaded with him. The father pleaded with the other son, but he answered his father and he said, look, all of these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you gave me Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, oh, then we kill the fatted calf. And the father said, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, he was dead. 
Now he's alive. He was lost. And now he's found. Get this, church. One son resented and rebelled against who his father was. He said, you're dead to me. I don't need you. I want what you have for me, and I'm out. And he left his father, and he tried to make it out on his own. The other son honored every word his father said and worked relentlessly for him. Watch this. It wasn't until the first son came back defeated and desperate that he became the only one of the two sons who finally saw his father as his dad. He was the only one of the two sons who realized, oh, my dad doesn't just own and operate this real estate. Oh, my dad isn't just who I, who I come from, but my dad loves me. My dad doesn't just want to make things right and fair, but he wants relationship with me. I tried to make things right. I tried to offer up a proposal and be his servant and maybe work my way into his good grace, but my dad wouldn't even let me get that far because he wants relationship. Here's the, here's the opportunity before us, mixed church, maybe for the first time for some of us, but certainly let's just keep a rhythm of this, is to make like the first son and run to our dad. And how do we do that? Here's how we do that. By trusting and leaning our lives completely into who the third son in the story is. I didn't miscount. It was the first son who resented and rebelled against his father but ended up experiencing redemption. Then you've got the second son tirelessly worked to earn his father's approval but he never knew his father and dad. But there is a third son and that third son is the son who is telling the story perfect son of God named Jesus. His whole point of telling this parable was to point us back to Abba. You and I don't get to pick our parents biologically or spiritually. God is our father whether you want him to be or not. There is no way of getting around and while we can resist, and you absolutely can launch a lifelong attempt to override God's authority, his authority is deeply wired into the operation of the world. It's how everything is set up. It's based on his goodness. We can't override his authority, but we can fight against it, and we can't change who our father is. But here's one thing that we do have say in. And it's whether or not we want relationship with our Father. It's whether or not we want to call him Dad. And the climax of the gospel story is that Jesus came to make that happen. And regardless of whether you are the younger son who, who you lost your way, you screwed it up. You tried to prove you were good. You tried to prove that you've got it. You tried to show your folks that I can do this. I can make it up. Regardless of whether you are the younger son and you are here broken and desperate for some hope or you are the other son and you want to know what? You've achieved it. You've got it. You are good. You've done it all by the, the book. Jesus is the one and only perfect son of God who came here and he lived and he died and he was resurrected so that we can run to him and be embraced by our Abba. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it, Romans 8, 15. This spirit, which is the spirit of Jesus that you've received, He's talking to the church here. He's talking to those of, uh, of his uh, uh, um, people who, who are, have decided to follow Jesus. They've bought into this whole Jesus lived, died, resurrected. If he be death, then he's got to be God. That's who, who Paul is talking to. And he said, the spirit that you've received, the spirit of Jesus does not make you slaves. Who was a slave in that story that we just talked about? The second son. 
always was a son, but he was living like a slave. What was the father's response? I'm your dad. Everything I have is yours. Why have, why have you stayed out in the field? Don't you know, like, I love you? And literally this is, you have access, but you stayed out in the field, didn't you? Living like a slave, even though you're a son, the spirit you have received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. But rather the spirit you have received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, what do we cry? Abba, Father, Dad. And by him, on a daily basis, we can approach God. And we don't just come and say, you are our origin. Yes, that's so important. We don't just get to say, you are the supreme authority. That is equally important. But we get to come to him and say, Dad coming to you with the knowledge that you love me that you are not like one of the Greek gods who, who's just exercising power to make your name great but I was designed for relationship with you and by the spirit of Jesus we cry Abba and because of Jesus by accepting Jesus and saying alright I'm in Jesus, because of Jesus, we can approach God and say, you are where I come from. And so I'm not going to figure that out today. You are how I am meant to live. How I am meant to live is found in you and your words. And you are Father, who my soul has been searching for. <sighs> Key word, Father. Key word, Dad. Would you stand with me, church? Worship team is going to lead us in a song, um, and I want to encourage you to truly use the next few minutes as a moment of reflection. And here's what I want to challenge you to do: you can totally sing. That's awesome. Um, but um, what if we just started to pray this a little bit? We just sat with this first exchange that Jesus gave us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let me fill in some gaps. Our dad who is in heaven, our dad who is in heaven, no less transcendent, no less superior, and yet intimately close. Not simply Elohim, which was what the Jewish people were known for. Elohim, he is so far beyond us. How could we even come to his presence? But instead Jesus says, no, 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 dad in heaven. Yes, he is so above you, but he's also right here. He's also with you. Hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. We, we just want to proclaim that your name is unlike any other name. Your name has just such an insane amount of value because it is what our souls are searching for. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And as we do that, and as you pray through that, I want you to work through those three paradigms of what Father says about you. And figure out where you need to stay. Is it with identity? been buying into a lie about who you are or trying to figure it out and man you've just been overtaken by by just a certain feeling or, or something that happened and begin to pray no my father my father he is my origin he is who I find myself is it is it with um, authority and again you've been lied to and you've been sold a really, really bad lie at that, that there is goodness outside of God's frame of reference. There isn't. He's the leading expert. And maybe you begin to surrender some of those things in your life that you have had authority over. For as much as we talk about autonomy, let me just say we, we don't, it's not autonomy. Like we just give authority to something else. We give authority to what our culture says. We give authority to our feelings. We give authority to our own understanding, but we just release that. Or is it that you need to call him dad? You need to call him father. And here's the deal. Some of you have never said that before. 
Some of you have never proclaimed that before because you have yet to meet Jesus. And that's where I want you to come back. Have a moment with God where you go to Jesus and you take his words to be true when he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. I'm the way. Come to me and I will show you the Father. And today can be the moment where before this moment, he was your father, he was your origin, he was your authority, but today he becomes your dad and someone that you can run to, someone who loves you and will lead you. God, we give you this moment. Holy Spirit, um, I just pray that if there's been any confusion in today's message, that you would clarify it and make it true to each of us and you would speak to us the word that we need. We pray this in your name.